In fact, what I'm going to talk about is uh, concepts that have been around for a long time. Uh, I, I think p perhaps what I might try and talk about is uh, maybe heretical. That's probably the, the closest to, uh, to, to define where I fit in this. So, so I'm going to talk about QC, the, the QC that we practice currently. And I'm going to talk about uh, two aspects to it. What, what's wrong with what we do currently? Uh, and what's the alternatives to conventional QC? I, I guess my interest in this was sparked uh, about uh, nine or so years ago when we did a survey uh, as a build-up to a, a QC workshop in Australia. And we did a survey and we asked uh, laboratories, a uh, selection of uh, significant laboratories in Australia, how often do you run QC in your laboratory? And uh, it turns out that most laboratories uh, run QC, conventional QC, once a, once a day or once a shift. So I, I guess 10 years ago I was a little bit surprised by that. Then we asked, uh, for your, in your SOPs, do you have an SOP that details for, to staff what do you do if your QC fails? Um, and we found about between uh, uh, 25 and uh, you know, perhaps a bit more percent of labs had no SOP. So that was a little bit surprising. Next thing we asked is, uh, if in fact your QC fails, uh, what do you do with the patient results? And these were the sort of responses that we got. So you can see there's a few yeses that say we have some sort of process in place, and there's a couple of noes. Those 13 answers represent the 13 answers from the uh, 52 or 60 people who are 60 labs that were in the survey. So, so I took that to mean that, in fact, with conventional QC, people run it once a day, they don't have any SOPs, and in many cases they don't have SOPs if it fails, and even if it does fail, they don't know what to do with the results anyway because they don't repeat the patient samples. So, in fact, about that time I came to the conclusion that conventional QC is a complete waste of time. And I think that we probably do it because we're forced to do it, but, in fact, we don't act on it, and it's a, it's a total waste of time. Uh, post that, we put together uh, a, a, an opinion paper uh, from the AECB uh, uh, trying to come up with some rules for, for QC. And, and one of the problems was really, uh, you know, how do you, how do you define frequency of QC? We said it should be based on sigma tests, and I, since I've got older, I've now lost all faith in sigma, because it depends what you use for the numerator of sigma. You know, your sigma could be 5 or 10 or 20 or really any number you like. Um, so I've lost all faith in that. Uh, frequency could be adjusted for critical tests, but in fact that sounds good, but in practice, you know, on an analyzer with, you know, 20 or 30 channels, you're going to run the same QC, you know, the same frequency for sodium as you do for urea. So that was a bit disappointing. Other people have, tr have been thinking about this as well, um, particularly Curtis Parvin, and he's come up with, uh, using conventional QC samples, he's come up with perhaps a better way of determining what the frequency should be for uh, uh, using conventional QC. Uh, very uh, elegant mathematics, um, but uh, almost completely under, un, un understandable. He suggested that, in fact, the performance of quality control procedures can be validated by uh, assessing the expected number of unreliable patient results produced and the expected number reported before and after the last accepted quality control evaluation. And he's come up with a patented model that allows you to actually determine the frequency based on, on these sorts of aspects. Um, but the problem is uh, you have to buy the software. And, and the software, I, I think, is almost uh, impenetrable. Uh, he, in a couple of papers published by, by Yago, um, there was some more detail about uh, how this algorithm might work. Uh, and it was interesting that, in fact, he seemed to settle on, uh, for these papers, on a frequency of about 100 patients. Um, it's probably better than once a shift or once a day, which depending on your analyzer and your laboratory might be 500 or 1,000 patients. Um, but to me, 100 sounds a nice round number. Uh, so I have to admit I wasn't convinced. Uh, there's a sort of a relationship there between uh, this max, max enough uh, and, and sigma. Um, so that's sort of nice, but again, it depends how you calculate sigma. So really both axes come out of space. Then I saw this paper. So this paper came out uh, mid last year uh, from, uh, in uh, uh, American Journal of Clinical Pathology from uh, uh, the uh, best practices, sorry, the practices in uh, 21 large academic medical centres in the US. They were in fact uh, 
listed in the US News and World Report as the, host, uh, the hospital top 20 honour roll, which I guess sounds pretty impressive. And when you read those laboratories, they, they did in, in fact seem to be the best laboratories uh, uh, in the state. What they found was that uh, basically when they surveyed these laboratories and asked, what do you, how do you run your QC? What sort of QC do you use? Um, there was sort of uh, a heterogeneous but surprisingly similar grouping of QC practices. Um, at least 75% of hospitals used a QC rule 2S, plus or minus 2S. That was their, their rule. 90% um, uh, used the policy of repeating an out-of-control QC. So if the QC failed, they, the 2S failed, you just rerun it. Surprisingly enough, that's the most powerful Westgard rule. Repeating a 2S rule is the most powerful rule of all the Westgard rules, even the multi-rules. Repeat a 2S is the most powerful rule. Um, but uh, this is fairly simplistic. Uh, I should have also said that in the previous Australian survey, it was much the same thing, that people just ran 2S. And in fact, in the Australian survey, most people, if the, if the 2S rule failed, they just re-ran it. That's how we know that that rule is far more powerful than all the other Westgard rules. Because based on that survey, Curtis Parvin then went away and did some work and came back and proved this is the most powerful rule. And this rule that repeat 2S is certainly in the current software, the BioRad software. So this is with conventional chemistry. For immunoassay, the same sort of thing occurred. They basically use 2S, repeat 2S. So what they said in this paper was there appears to be no systematic approach to defining QC rules or frequency. So after talking about QC for 40 years or 50 years, we haven't really progressed past the 2S rule and repeat it. One of the problems with the repeat 2S rule is you can go on ad nauseum, you know, repeat, 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 and eventually you'll get it in. Because the last thing we want to do is repeat patient samples because usually they're gone. You know, the whole process, the whole reason why this is so hard is that the need to put out results is, uh, is there and we need to get these results out. That's why we tend to ignore QC, apart from the 15189 assessor. And this just is uh, from that paper and it really just says, uh, you know, the sort of the, even though there's a, there's a lot of labs there, they basically all use uh, the, the 1 2 S rule infrequently. So uh, at the end of the paper, what they said was... Uh, we observe significant variation, unexpected similarities. Uh, this level in practice indicates an opportunity exists to establish an evidence-based approach to QC that can be generalised across institutions. This is uh, 2018, basically saying we don't know how to do QC. So uh, lots of stuff we do is uh, very exciting, but in fact I think we've dropped the ball on how we do conventional QC process. Thank heavens the analyzers are so good that it doesn't actually make any difference what we do. And I think that's what's been shown. What did happen, though, and I think this is really quite surprising, uh, up till uh, uh, that paper, uh, Westgard had never... Uh, Westgard and Westgard, and I'm not being critical of, of Westgard Senior because what he did in the 70s was uh, very, very significant in terms of giving us a language and trying to standardise uh, what we do. Didn't work, but he really started doing that. What uh, 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 he and his son did uh, post this paper was to come out with a new set of Westgard rules, which a uh, fairly complex process, but it brings in six sigma, uh, brings in uh, uh, you know, so the, the sigma metric, the rules, and it brings in frequency. So all of a sudden, out of almost nowhere, frequency popped up. But even more interesting, I think, uh, so this just goes through uh, the process, and it's a pretty nice process. This is the new set of, QC, of uh, Westgard rules, and what you will notice in that new schema is there is no 2S. So his response to uh, the, the, uh, the survey of 21 labs was, if all you guys are going to do is use 2S and you think there's a problem with it, I'm not going to let you use it anymore. Uh, if that's not being petty, I don't know what is. So it, it starts with the 3S rule, drops the 2S rule. Uh, so this was uh, an editorial in the same uh, journal by Curtis and he said, many of the new QC planning parameters that impact patient risk are all about time. The length of time between QC evaluations, occurrences of out-of-control conditions and the identity and, and correct erroneous patient results re requirement to do that. 
Uh, incorporating these additional parameters into full patient risk models is, is the next step in planning statistical QC strategies to minimise patient risk. Okay, so around about now I hope you think, uh, I'm not sure what your practice is, but I hope you're starting to think, uh, well, what, what are we actually doing with QC? How well have we got control over it? Does conventional QC work? I don't think conventional QC works. Not the way we do it. And I don't think conventional QC will ever work because I think there's another problem with conventional QC. And the theory that, in fact, you've got two types of error, systematic error and random error, I don't think that stands up to scrutiny either, and I'll prove it to you shortly. So we, we sort of we look at QC this way. We're going in a train through a tunnel, and somewhere up there, there's another QC sample coming at the end of the day or the end of the shift or something or other. And we assume that everything's fine until we hit that QC sample. The other thing we assume is that, you know, you've got random errors, so something happens and we can never track it. We can never work out what went wrong. Or there's been systematic error and there's been a shift, OK? There's been a shift because of bias or because of a reagent change or maybe something else. But we assume that once this shift has occurred, it's going to stay shifted until we happen to run a QC sample. Why would that happen? I mean, the whole basis of running QC is that, you know, there's a shift, you detect it. Why can't there be a shift for a period of, sam of samples and, and it return to normal? Why, why can't that happen? So what are the, what are the alternatives to conventional QC? Patient-based, real-time QC. Now, the idea has been around for a long time. As I say, this is sort of like back to the future stuff. It started in the 60s with uh, Hoffman and Wade... Uh, using sort of an average of normals approach, and then uh, Bull came up with his uh, sort of famous uh, uh, exponential-based model. Why would you use it? Uh, sometimes other controls are unavailable or impractical. Patient results might detect an issue that other forms of QC cannot. And, and using patient-based real-time QC with the right data, you can detect pre-analytical issues. You can detect problems with phlebotomists. You can detect problems with, with transport, if you know where the, where the sample's coming from. So there's a whole new area that uh, this, area, this can unlock. The state of, testing the pro of the testing process can be assessed between the times of routine-based QC, which, as I say, might be once a day. In some labs, they run QC in the morning only. So the first that they know that yesterday's run failed is tomorrow morning. Uh, there's little cost and the sample is commutable. Reagent uh, can use, used to detect a lot-to-lot -lot variation and, so say, pre-analytical factors. And the haematologists, dare I say, have been using this since, since the 70s. They had to use it because in those days they had no appropriate sample. You know, they had to use uh, something with, based on patients because it took a long time to come up with a stable red cell alternative. So the moving average, you know, it's, I'm sure you all know about it, it basically runs like this. You work out, you have a series of patients, you work out the mean, um, with the moving average, when the next patient comes in, you have a block size, so that rec rectangle represents a block of 15. You, you, you average uh, the next sample, add the next sample into the average, you drop the last one off. Similarly, you move on, add the next sample in, take your average, drop the last one off, OK? So it's a moving average. You may smooth the results, uh, but that's, that's basically how it works. So what you're actually looking at there is a bracket of results. So this bracketing sort of can take over what we used to do in the days of the smack where you had a control at the beginning and the end. You can actually use this as a way of bracketing in control patient samples. Um, and uh, I suspect you know that in fact there's an IFCC working group which I represent uh, who have been trying to come up with a whole lot of information about how do labs actually implement this. And I'll tell you now one of the other things I've decided after looking at this for, for a period of time I, I don't think, I think part of the problem with QC, conventional or this sort of QC, is it's humans can't cope with it. Th these sort of decisions are too hard for humans to make. This should not be being done by humans. So real time, uh, what's real time QC error detection rate based on? It's based on this ratio of uh, sort of the within group uh, uh, biological variation to, C, to analytical vari uh, variation and it works particularly well for low sigma assays. And again, this is a real sigma this isn't a sigma based on, you know, uh, you know a numerator of 30% uh, based on uh, you know, sort of some EQA schemes. Depends on the block size, that is how many you use to determine your moving mean or whatever. What's your truncate? You do remove a high and low patient sample so there's not too much of an impact. Um, 
Uh, you have control limits, which really relate to the standard error of the mean or the median, and the number of patients that are excluded by the truncation limits. So if you've got a lot of patients that are abnormal, you're going to have less data uh, to produce this uh, mean or median or, or whatever else it is that you might use. And the size of the bias, um, generally speaking, uh, patient-based real-time QC is far more sensitive than conventional QC. And you might add a weighting or a smoothing factor in there so that more recent patient data have a bigger impact on the ratio than older data because you're trying to detect change, new change, not stable change. Uh, this is just a table from uh, that, that, that paper which just shows the, sort of the, the, the key differences between uh, patient-based real-time QC and statistical QC. You know, patient-based is uh, continuous, it's commutable, um, and uh, there is only one QC level though. You know, it's the average or whatever you, whatever you use as your, your moving parameter, uh, whereas with statistical QC there may be more than one QC level. But often those QC levels are poorly chosen. Um, and there's more processes there about validation, etc. Um, so general, the general considerations for implementing patient-based quality control, it's, it's not as easy as conventional QC. Okay? And I've just told you that conventional QC doesn't work because I think it's beyond humans to be able to cope with making those sort of decisions, particularly when those decisions mean I'm going to have to repeat a whole lot of samples or I'm going to have to uh, uh, send out amended reports. People don't want to do that. What you need to do is you, three things. Basically, you need to understand the biological and analytical characteristics of the test of interest. You need to understand your patient population or populations um, and you need to understand the capability of your LIS because I can guarantee right now your LIS probably will not be capable. Thank heavens, instrument manufacturers are on top of this and, and the next batch of equipment that's going to come out will have all of this on board. They're not stupid. So, um, this is about, uh, this is a, sort of a significant paper that came from Fleming and Kadiev uh, in uh, uh, 2015 uh, and uh, it just shows that in fact you don't have to be restricted to just mean or median. There's a whole lot of other things you can use based on patient data. Some that has more sensitivity than just using a mean or a median. You can transform the data, transform the mean or the median, you can smooth it, um, you can add square roots. So using square roots of some patient data is, uh, is very useful. Uh, and again, there can be logs or all sorts of variations in there. Um, and they've used all of that. They've been using, uh, they're from LabCorp in the States, they've been using this for about three years in all their labs uh, routinely. The results, uh, this is uh, from that paper, block size of 50, so it's not too many, so that represents a number of patients that you're going to withhold. You know, as the next one comes in, you release the last one, so you're going to be uh, only really, you're bracketing 50 patients. Um, they used moving mean and moving median, and they had a zero false rejection rate for 28 out of 48, 24, sorry, out of 28 tests. Four, four tests had a false rejection rate ranging from 0.2 to 1, and the error detection rate was 100%. Remember, conventional QC, you aim to get 90%. Um, and uh, that just shows you. And the other thing, of course, it's cost effective because you're not using as much QC and they reduce their QC material usage by about 75%. And repeat analysis reduced by approximately 50%. That's what it looks like. It just looks like sort of a conventional uh, QC chart. Um, and I say what's interesting about them was that that's in fact, this is square roots of unbiased test results. Uh, and they use this concept of releasing the last point that, that's, uh, that falls out of the block. So it's the same as using bracketed QC. So it's sort of, it, 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 it works uh, in terms of having some control. There's a, quite a few other variations on the theme. This is uh, from uh, Savinsky, Ng and Savinsky, where they used this data, this used this approach in hospital patients. LabCorp have a majority of their patients are, are outpatients. This is based on hospital patients because people say it's not going to work in my institution because I've got all these sick people. In fact, you know that in the morning you've got sick people and generally speaking in the afternoon you've got not so sick people based on inpatients or outpatients. Um, but, uh, in, and in fact, there are different populations. So this is from that paper and it shows distributions for key analytes uh, for uh, inpatients, outpatients and total patients. And you can see that, uh, you know, not surprisingly, calcium, uh, bicarbonate, uh, AST, 
and, and creatinine. You can see that there are differences in those distributions. So what you have to do is rather than having one median, you might have three. Uh, median for inpatients or mean, median for outpatients or mean, and a median for both. In fact, uh, they really only had to do that for three analytes. Uh, so most inpatient and outpatients, means and medians work. You don't need to, to uh, split the population, but you do need to be able to identify them. So it becomes more complex in what you have to be able to uh, extract from your database. There's other things we know about flagging. You know, there's flagger and percentile where you can look at the percentage of patients that fall outside um, uh, you know, the reference interval or at the 50th percentile. Um, we, we, there was a, a situation in, in Australia a couple of years ago where there was a sort of a, a, a PSA um, a scandal uh, where a particular laboratory uh, had problems with their, their PSA levels, low levels, in uh, patients that were uh, post-prostatectomy and uh, urologists were obviously using PSA as a marker to see if there was a, sort of a, 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 a recurrence of the tumour. Uh, the, the, the urologist had a gut feeling that, in fact, he was seeing more positives post-prostatectomy uh, than he used to see before. So he... Um, this is him now. I just asked him to come and speak to us. Um, so uh, he, uh, he phoned at the lab and said, something wrong, the assay. And they said, oh, no, I he's fine. Um, and uh, so uh, he waddled on a bit longer. Same problem. He said, there's something wrong with your assay. He said, no, there's nothing wrong. So he ended up getting the patients to go to two blood collection centres, uh, uh, two labs, and split the results. And, of course, the lab was wrong. So that made us think, you know, there's, there's another opportunity for something like a moving average. In, 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 uh, in his practice, this uh, urologist's practice, about 40% of patients post-prostatectomy had a detectable PSA normally. Uh, post this change to this assay in this laboratory, he was getting 80%, so he could pick that up. The lab couldn't pick it up with their QC. He could pick it, pick it up from his gut feeling. So, in fact, we converted that into a moving average as well. So what's the percentage above, in this particular case, 40% uh, that you see? And, in fact, that flags... And that flagged, when we modelled the data, that flagged long before conventional QC would flag. So you don't just restrict yourself to conventional concepts of moving averages. And what this uh, pointed out, this particular case, was, you know, what's, what's in your quality control strategy? There's usually something about the frequency that you use QC, something about the rules that you use. You know, as I say, in, a, in most labs, it's, uh, you know, frequency of once a day... Uh, QC rules, maybe, you know, repeat 2S or, you know, keep doing 2S ad nauseum. Um, but QC concentration is the other aspect that people forget about when they think about QC strategy. In this particular lab, you know, they were trying to detect uh, PSA levels of 0.03. Uh, their lowest QC was 0.7. So statistically, they would never, and they didn't, ever pick up the problem. But we forget about important decision levels, particularly when a test is being used for more than one thing. You know, we think about PSA as used at sort of the higher end for diagnosis, not at the lower end for monitoring. And again, uh, we also came up with a moving SD. You know, this is a population. So the population, the population not only has a mean or median, it's actually got an SD. So we modelled SD as well, come up with a formula for SD, and sort of SD was of, of any value. Um, it's not of much value, except if you get a shift in, in your baseline. And, of course, not surprisingly, at that time, the SD changes. So moving SD supports moving median. And again, uh, moving average is, is suitable for detecting large analytical shift. Uh, the moving uh, um, sum of outliers is uh, suitable for detecting critical shifts at low concentrations. Or, in fact, it can be used for assays like uh, semi-quantitative assays as well, you know, where you have a positive or a negative. Um, and moving SD is useful for detecting increased analytical imprecision. So how do you do this? You know, how do you run uh, this sort of patient-based real-time thing with conventional QC? You can run it in parallel with conventional QC, and that's what the haematologists have ended up doing. You know, they started off with using the sort of Bull's algorithm, and they used to bleed a, usually a staff member in the morning, and they'd run them as a, a, a sort of a drift control. Um, but then when conventional QC became available, they kept doing all that and then they ran conventional QC. And when there became a conventional uh, alternative to the, the, um, the uh, drift control, they put that in there as well. So what they've done is they just add more and more and more and more. That's not the way we should go. Um, that's not the way we should go. 
You can run conventional QC at the start and the end of the shift and run patient-based real-time QC. And in fact, that's what is probably the ideal model in the short term. And that certainly will meet the requirements of the regulator. Run QC, uh, sorry, run patient-based real-time QC until the error is detected and then use Q conventional QC to troubleshoot. But I actually don't think you need conventional QC at all. I think you can just use, apart from bicarbonate, just use uh, patient samples and use those to verify that in fact there's been a shift. It's just store some samples. Uh, and we know that in fact now there's, uh, 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 there's patient-based real-time QC is also being used as, as an EQA, which I think will be incredibly useful in terms of um, post-market surveillance. This is just some data from Curtis uh, that he presented and basically what it shows is if you used one of these patient-based real-time QC processes, uh, you can see enough is his uh, uh, sort of the expected number of patients that are, that are released uh, when they shouldn't be. Uh, you can see that the blue line which represents, represents a combination of, in potassium of conventional QC and patient-based real-time QC, it's the best per, by far. And this is that example I, I, I mentioned before. This is uh, real data from a lab in, uh, in uh, the Netherlands. Uh, and it's, uh, you know, green represents in control, uh, sort of tan, uh, magenta represents out of control, real data. Um, and you can see that it goes out of, this is sodium, so on an IC, uh, goes out of control here, um, uh, where the, where the um, I hope I don't switch something off, um, where the QC would normally run is around about here. Uh, and had they run QC here, it, was, it would have been completely in control. Uh, this is one day, the next day it goes out of control again. Uh, they call, when they saw this data, they didn't know what it meant. They re-ran these patients and in fact there was clinically significant differences in the sodium, so they in fact are wrong. Uh, they had to repeat these sodiums and re release the results. Um, this represented uh, a problem. The, the, uh, the technician came in, couldn't sort out what was going on. Next day it happened again uh, and eventually he found a problem in the instrument. So the concept that things go out of control, you know, there's a spike because of some random thing, that's probably possible. The concept that it goes out of control and stays out of control until we detect it, that's crazy thinking. Why, why, why do we think that? And there's evidence that it doesn't work. Uh, and that's another example of the same thing. Goes out of control, comes back in. Um, you know, part of the problem is uh, uh, how do you validate and verify this and it's not, uh, it's not easy. And again, this is why we need help to do it. Um, and in fact, I, I, my personal belief, and this isn't because I'm involved with EQA, is I, I actually think that, that real-time EQA plus patient-based real-time QC will be the way of the future. Patient-based real-time QC to detect an error, uh, real-time EQA to detect bias and, and to allow... Um, standardisation across the globe. So uh, there's a series of papers coming out from this group because this is hard um, about, first of all, what analytical uh, system do you need? Sorry, what LIS system do you need? Uh, this is sort of the information that we've, uh, we've decided that you need uh, in your LIS or your middleware. Uh, so it's all in the paper. Um, and these are the essential features we think of, uh, of, of the middleware as well. We're, we're currently doing an audit against uh, uh, what manufacturers provide and what some middleware provides, and we're going to deal with uh, uh, suppliers in the future, vendors in the future, to try and uh, in ensure that they provide the information that we think is necessary. So that's how I see patient-based real-time QC. In summary, uh, QC has become in many labs uh, poorly understood, uh, relying on compliance. It promises better detection in error in real time. This is more than, uh, there is more we can learn about this. And uh, I'll just say it's about time, and I'll just, if I can just, next steps are, uh, there's a paper on simulation coming, and there's a paper on the validation process coming from the group. We need the involvement of vendors, uh, and AI is, uh, for QC, I don't think it's a human thing. We can't do this sort of QC. And if, I can, if you can just indulge me for a minute, uh, that's why I think there's no, there's no humans can do this. Um, this is, I'm just going to compare uh, you know, QC in the 50s with uh, QC in the 50s, really. Can I have the volume? Well, that's right. Anyway, th this just shows you what, what, what used to happen in the 50s. I love the way the guy's getting the tyre off. <laughs> Get us a drink. He gets a drink too.
cleans the windscreen. This is how we do QC in the 50s. This is how we do QC now, I hate to say it. You don't, they do have to change four tyres. Take a few photographs. And it actually took about 63 seconds, so that's good. This is how we should be doing QC. They do, in fact, change four tyres. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and that's, that's, that's the team.